Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for the invite. I hope my voice holds up. It's uh, not exceptional. It's a result of an operation a couple of years ago. So um, this morning, as Graham indicated, I want to just talk about a couple of aspects um, from a, of, um, of a couple of issues that are facing um, dairy farming in particular as we move into the 2020s. Firstly, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about CRV Ambreed and what we where we fit into the picture as a company, and uh, then move into the main part of the talk, some issues facing pastoral farming and what CRV Ambreed is doing. So a bit about us. CRV Ambreed, many of you will uh, have talked, uh, have been um, met people or whatever uh, over the last 40 years. Um, Ambreed's been involved in beef cattle, but uh, in the last uh, 20 or so years, we've certainly um, uh, concentrated on the dairy industry. So we're a herd improvement company established in New Zealand, as I say, about 40 years ago, um, initially around the beef side of things. Um, but as I say, now just about 100% um, focused on the dairy industry. We established uh, what's now owned by a cooperative of uh, Belgian and Dutch dairy farmers. So we were bought, uh, Ambreed was bought uh, about 12 years ago by this uh, cooperative. The headquarters is in Arnhem, the Netherlands, and we have business units in New Zealand, Britain, the Czech Republic, Germany, Brazil, the States, and South Africa. So an international herd improvement company, New Zealand, CRV Ambreed, is the New Zealand arm of that company. What do we do? Our products and services, mainly we focus on genetics. We progeny test about 120 dairy bulls each year and we sell about uh, 1.1 million straws in the New Zealand market. That's about over 25% and we export typically around 0.4 million straws of semen. As well, very important part of the business is the information products that uh, dairy farmers are pretty reliant on for their ma herd management decisions and that's based on our herd testing and recording services. So a couple of issues that I wanted to talk about this morning and take this opportunity to um, just give a perspective of what we're up to at Ambreed. Um, and the first is uh, accelerating the rate of genetic gain. So it's an old issue, but um, we have a new technology that's being fairly rapidly embraced, not only by the dairy industry, but also by beef and other species, and that, of course, is genomics. So what have we done historically to um, maximise, if you like, or optimise the rate of genetic gain, um, and particularly in the dairy industry. What's really important um, to acknowledge in the dairy industry or to, to be aware of is the wide use of artificial insemination. So with that, it means that elite bulls can be very heavily used and they have a big impact genetically. So we have instances of New Zealand of single bulls um, siring up to you know, over 200,000 daughters per bull. That's quite exceptional, but there are bulls that have over 200,000 herd tested daughters in the New Zealand dairy herd. So this sort of use makes it economically and genetically sensible to accurately test bulls to identify those genetically elite animals. And historically, that's been done through progeny testing. It's an expensive exercise, it's time consuming, in 
and that elongates or lengthens the generation interval. So a bull, before he's um, proven and widely used in the dairy industry, is typically five years old by the time those daughters are milked in the progeny test situation. So genetically, a time-consuming, long generation interval, but we have a very high accuracy of individual bull selection. And the accuracy is uh, typically about 87 to 90% when the bull is first proven. And once his daughters, his main crop daughters are used, then he's up to 99% accurate. So over the last 10, 12 years, 15 years, um, we've become involved in the genomics and genomic selection. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because no doubt you're all aware that basically genomics involves reading the DNA of an animal and comparing that DNA to a library of DNA, which we refer to as the reference or training population. So the reference population contains the relationships between the genetic markers and the phenotypes or the measurements on the animals. And to do genomics well, basically, we need to have a good reference population. So we need DNA and the phenotypes for many reference animals. And of course, we need very good phenotypes for those traits of interest. And that allows us to estimate breeding values or genomic breeding values um, of animals at a very young age. So we take a DNA sample from a calf, read it, compare it to the reference population, and we get an estimate of the animal's breeding values. Ourselves, as a company, our involvement with genomic, we've been genomics, we've been involved for <coughs> almost 10 years um, in association with our headquarters and the Australian Dairy Futures CRC. So we've had a joint uh, research program going with those groups. And where we are, if we use a trait like protein, our protein BV accuracy has increased from about 0.6, which is the parent average, based on parent average, to 0.68. So that's the parent average, our estimate of the animal's breeding value based just as the average, as the average of its parents. Plus genomics, that takes our accuracy to 0.68 for the average young bull. So our aim, if it is to get to 0.87 or so, which we get from our progeny test program, we've still got quite a way to go. So we've achieved that um, lift from about 0.6 to approaching 0.7 in accuracy with a reference population of around 3,000 bulls that are well proven and we've had 25,000 cows that we've referenced. Our aim is to reference 100,000 cows, in other words, have genomics on 100,000 cows to further lift these accuracies. If we compare where we are in New Zealand with our Eurogenomics group, that is a consortium of uh, European researchers in, in, in various countries, including Holland and Germany, their accuracy for young bulls is up to 0.8, and that's with a reference population of 25,000 proven bulls. One of the issues facing genomics in the New Zealand dairy industry is that a dairy cow population is very heterogeneous. So there's been a huge amount, by that, I mean there's been a huge amount of crossbreeding in the dairy industry. So we've got a, a mixture of Jersey and Frisian genes combined with the Escher, and they're reasonably common current breeds. But if we go back 100 years, the industry was basically founded on shorthorn cows. 
So we have this huge dichotomy of genes that I personally believe is um, one of the issues that we have to confront to get our reliabilities or accuracies higher in the New Zealand dairy um, evaluations. Current use of the Ambreed of genomics. So we use genomics as a tool to select our 120 young bulls each year and they go into our progeny test program. So we use genomics to give us a better estimate of what their breeding values might be. And then um, we market some of those young sires. Um, as young sires, we recommend that a team of them is used. And um, in time, we anticipate we will sell semen from young genomically selected bulls and our progeny test program as it is now will be defunct. <coughs> With regard to genotyping females, because we do have a interest from dairy farmers to commercially genotype females, there's some low hanging fruit when it comes to um, genotyping. We can parent or at least initially sire verify for the young heifer. So we can say with certainty what the sire is and after a period of time when we've genotyped for a number of years we have the genotypes of the females in the herd as well and we can parent verify. And we can fairly easily um, get a handle on traits controlled by single genes, for example, polled, and some health and fitness traits. So that's straight up what we get from genotyping. Um, as we build up reliability, or I should have used the term accuracy, we'll move towards genomic herd management. And that is our aim at uh, CRV Ambreed, is to be genomically testing heifers for commercial farmers so they can identify which young heifers to rear at an early age and dispose of the rest. So that's where we want to get to with genomics over the next 15 or so years. Well, hopefully um, a shorter period of time. So the second issue I thought uh, we'd talk about this morning was um, a new issue but using an old technology um, and that's the deterioration of water quality, the environmental issue that's confronting all of New Zealand, not just farmers. So over the last few years deterioration of waterways has become a very important issue in New Zealand or it's being recognised I should say in the last few years. And nitrogen leached from the cow urine patch is a primary source of that uh, deterioration. This year, many of you may be aware, we are marketing genetics, which we expect to reduce the amount of urinary nitrogen excreted by the cow and reduce mean leaching. So a little bit on this, um, what, uh, it's a little bit on what we're actually measuring here to give us an estimate of um, which cows and which bulls are the good ones and which are the bad ones. We've measured milk urea nitrogen in about 650,000 milk samples on individual cows. So there are individual milk samples measured through our herd testing service. We've done the genetic analyses on this fairly extensively, both in Holland and with AgriSearch. And the heritability of our New Zealand population is about 0.2. And we have a substantial range in breeding values among bulls for man. So we know from this and from overseas work, which is completely um, collaborates what we've or corroborates what we've found, we now know that we can reduce MUN through genetic selection. So we are confident we can do that. 
What does that mean? Well, for animals that are fed on different diets, which is different to breeding, but considered on different diets, there's a very strong relationship between milk urea and urinary nitrogen. So on this graph, which is a series of lines which just represent a whole lot of different overseas research um, findings, we have a straight line between milk urea nitrogen, which is on the bottom axis, axis, and the amount of nitrogen excreted as urinary nitrogen per day, which is on the y-axis. And the relationship is about um, 15 grams of urinary nitrogen per day per one unit of mum. The average New Zealand cow has a milk urea nitrogen concentration reading, when we look at it, of about 14. And that equates, using these relationships, to the cow, average cow, excreting about 210 grams of nitrogen per day. So over a year, the average New Zealand dairy cow is peeing out around about 70 kilograms of nitrogen onto the paddock. So what does this mean? We know there's a strong relationship between milk urea nitrogen and urinary nitrogen when cows are fed differently. We know from our work over the last five years that we can reduce milk urea nitrogen through genetics. The question now becomes, do animals that are genetically different from mum excrete different amounts of urinary nitrogen when they are fed the same diet? So what happens to this dietary nitrogen? So say the cow, the cow eats about 5,000 kilograms of dry matter. It's about 20% maybe a bit more protein. And protein is about a sixth nitrogen. So the dairy cow eats about 170 kilograms of nitrogen per year. The amount of nitrogen in her milk protein is around about 25 to 30 kilograms. The muscle gain in the mature cow, once she's attained a mature body weight, is virtually zero. There's a little bit of nitrogen, muscle loss, muscle gain, but the net effect is near zero. And the urine is about 70 kilograms, so the rest goes into dung and nitrogen gases. My point here is that what we're talking about reducing milk urea and urine nitrogen by is relatively small proportion of the 70 kilograms. And it's quite likely that cows different of different genotypes do partition dietary nitrogen into things other than urine or can, that there can be differences in the way that cows partition that dietary nitrogen. So if we model what might be happening to this MUN and the reduction, and assuming that this MUN urinary nitrogen relationship holds up, then the offspring of our 2017 low size team, as we call them, these are bulls that we're marketing this year, will excrete about three and a half kilograms less nitrogen per year as urine. And that in turn, when we model that, there'll be a reduction of eight to 10% in nitrogen leached. So in one hit, if these relationships hold up, we might reduce leaching by eight to 10%, just with bulls currently available. And then if we further model that out, over eight years, we believe it's possible to reduce nitrogen leaching by 13 
to 15% through genetics. And our brand line, if you like, we're promoting a reduction in nitrogen leaching of 20% in 20 years through genetics. And that will be in addition to other strategies that farmers can take, for example, through modifying feeding, etc. This is um, a very important finding. And um, in fact, the latest run was just completed last evening. So you're the first people to know about it. Um, we found in our um, analyses that low MUN genetics tends to have a high percent protein in the milk. So this is pretty good evidence that indeed animals are partitioning dietary nitrogen differently. So we might be getting a double hit here. Our low MUN animals may be putting less nitrogen into urine, meaning less leached, and be more efficient in using dietary nitrogen for production. Of course, um, there's a lot of future work required to um, prove some of this stuff. Um, we have a partnership bid to the government. Um, we need to prove that that MUN urinary nitrogen pathway holds for genetically different cattle. Ultimately, or within a few years, the intention is to include MUN in compliance models and breeding indexes and to demonstrate in farmlet systems. So it's a fairly comprehensive proposed program here, going, up, going out over seven years. What are the implications for sheep and beef farmers? Well, of course, lactating cows aren't the only ruminants that pee in the paddock. And the, um, many of you will maybe graze young dairy stock, or certainly it's become a common practice on many sheep and beef farmers. So improved, genetically improved young stock is going to result in less nitrogen being deposited in the paddock. Beef source from dairy is also potentially a gain into the beef industry. And we have some ideas around measuring markers from um, milk urea in the young bull, and that will have implication for beef breeding as we move forward. So we do see implications for the beef industry particular um, in this work and that will be an avenue of the future research. So with that I'll finish. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk this morning, Graham and the team. And uh, I don't know if we've got time for questions or not. We do. Thanks, Betty. Um, when, when you said you were going to be evaluating the effect of feed on the nitrogen um, output, will you be, I presume you'll be evaluating uh, biological farming pasture and systems like that, or is this project sponsored by Ravensdale? <laughs> um, so look, the, the systems work, you're meaning with regard to milk urea? Um, the systems work there will involve looking at genetics plus different feeds. But I would be thinking, would be looking at traditional pastures versus things like chicory um, and plantains. So looking at the, how farmers can put together systems, genetics plus feeding plus whatever else to um, reduce this um, or mitigate the nitrogen excretion and uh, leaching. Is that okay? Um, Bill, when you select those young calves, uh, do 
incredibly. Are you just using the dynamic trading values or using a, a single table or claim that covers the uh, yep. dynamic? Yep, it's total uh, EBV. Um, but basically we're just going, we just use information on the parents plus the genomics to give us that EBV. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it's done out of H. I don't do it personally. It's uh, done out of HQ. So our genetics team in Holland do all our genomic evaluations. Been a long time since the development uh, council days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> do you have a cross-country evaluation? That is certainly one of the aims, and, and particularly to work with the Australians, um, has been a, lo uh, looking at cross-country evaluations. Um, we, we have done some cross-country evaluation, um, not currently using it within our own genomic uh, predictions. <laughs> 